Hello everybody, welcome back to one more book review video. It's been a while since I've done one of these because most of the books I've read recently have been books that are over 10 years old or at least 5 to 6 years old. So I finally read a new book. It is Secret Project 3 by Brandon Sanderson, a book that I've been waiting for for a long, long time. And yeah, um, let's get started. So for those of you who don't know, Sanderson wrote five books which he's going to be releasing this year. He's already released two. The first one was part of the Cosmere, Tress of the Emerald Sea, a book that I really, really like. The second one is a non-Cosmere book, so I wasn't really into it. Maybe I'll pick it up some other time. If I do, I will let you guys know. The third one, Secret Project 3, is called Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. Now, I was really excited coming into this book because we were going to get to see a new part of the Cosmere, a new planet, as well as a planet that has a lot of Cosmere implications, naturally, because this is a place where one of the 16 shards splintered. Now, for those of you who don't follow the Cosmere, uh, I would say now is a good time to step away and read a few books from the Cosmere before coming back here, or uh, hopefully finish off the Mistborn era one and the Stormlight books that are out before you come here. If possible, you can read Arcane and Unbounded. You probably can't see it in the frame. It's right there. So, <clears throat> Yumi and the Nightmare Painter is... I... I came into this book expecting another uh, classic Brandon Sanderson epic fantasy with a lot of uh, interesting magic and very fun characters. But boy was I wrong. This was not... This was fantasy. Obviously there's magic, there is uh, adventure, there's all of the things that you expect to see from a Cosmere novel written by Brandon Sanderson. But there is also so much more. The, the primary genre of this book is not fantasy, it's not adventure, it's not heroism. Strangely, it was romance. And that is something I really enjoyed because I generally don't enjoy reading the genre, but this was a book that did it really well. So for me, this book, especially, uh, to be fair, his secret project so far, everything I've heard about the secret project too also has been great. But of the ones that I've read, the two of them, they hold up really high, even in the Sanderson standard. They are already two of the top five books in the, that I've ever read, written by him. And he's written a lot of them, so that's high praise. The only books that I would say from the main Cosmere, from the previous books that I would feel are better than both Tress of the Emerald Sea and Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, I would say Emperor's Soul is a great book. Um, for me, Words of Radiance and The Final Empire would rank slightly over these two. But other than that, I think these two books pretty much beat every other book written by him before. And that is something that I was really surprised by because while I expected a fun fantasy read, I did not expect these books to be as enthralling as the other ones because he himself said these were written in a very short period of time. So I did not expect that, but maybe he writes better when he writes faster. So I have a lot of hope for Stormlight 5. So this, as I said already, pure genius writing. I really, really enjoyed every aspect of this book. But as much as I loved the writing, I genuinely think something that held up just as much for me in this book was the artwork by Alia Shen. Shen Chen, I don't know how you pronounce the name, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, but the point is, the illustrator was amazing. I really, really enjoyed the artwork in this book. I am not one to pick up a story if the artwork is nice. I'm not someone who does that. I will obviously be drawn to a book if, the, if it has a good cover, but beyond that, I don't really care much about it. Uh, but for the first time, I actually paused whenever there was a piece of uh, art in the book and took a break between my reading to like look at the art and, art and appreciate it because it really was that good. I think the artist has definitely understood the story really, really well and understood the characters really well because they represented these characters perfectly and there were two styles of art within the book. 
which we will talk about once we get to the spoiler section. But for now, this is the non-spoiler section. Oh yeah, for those of you who don't know, this is the non-spoiler section of my review of Yumi and the Nightmare Painter and why I think you should read it. So for me, every time, whenever I look at a book like this, there are three things I judge it by. How hard the emotional moments hit you, how well the humor is written, and how intrigued was I with the overall plot of the story. Now for this book, I have to say the emotional moments hit me really hard. They were really well written, they were well delivered, they were well executed, and I genuinely cared about the emotions that the characters were feeling or the emotions that the situations that the characters were in made me feel. So that is something that I think uh, this book nailed. I think Sanderson has always been good at it. He has always managed to deliver the character's emotions to the reader really well and he's very good at making the reader empathize with his characters. Um, humor, Sanderson has always been great at humor. But his humor is usually delivered through characters within the story rather than the narration itself. The narration itself is pretty straightforward with Sanderson. But with both Tress of the Emerald Sea and Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, we can really, really see Sanderson flesh out the funny narration uh, that can be done in his books. I mean, again, one could also argue that this is still narrated by a character within the book, so that kind of makes sense, but at the same time, this is, this is a third person perspective written from the point of view of a different person. The, so basically, the character who's narrating the story is not the POV character for the story. So that is something that I found very interesting uh, because the fact that the narrative could be inside the head of two different characters and narrate the story done really well. Um, the intrigue of the plot, for me, personally, I don't think the plot itself was that great. I think it was a pretty basic plot. It tackled a very interesting concept and I will get into that in the spoiler section, but despite that very interesting uh, debate that Sanderson tried to spark within the book, I don't think the plot itself was genius. I think it's a very simple plot, but I feel like that is why this, the book itself worked because the plot was simple. If it had a really complicated antagonist or a really complicated mystery to solve, I don't think the characters would have been as fleshed out as they were because of the lack of the sense of urgency in them. Although they thought they had a sense of urgency compared to other works that we've read from Sanderson the sense of urgency in the story wasn't really present. Um, as for the characters that I enjoyed, okay, so the characters that I really enjoyed, obviously I loved reading Yumi and The Nightmare Painter, which is also the book title. Other than the main characters themselves, I really enjoyed uh, Nightmare, The Painter's friends. Their group was really well written. The group dynamics were, were very realistic. They, I felt like I was actually hanging out among a group of friends and listening to them talk whenever they're having lunch or when they're out shopping. It worked really well. Now the characters on, the, on Yumi's side of the story were vastly different. Uh, these characters are far more, well, they're far more typical Sanderson characters. So we've seen other versions of these characters play out over and over again in various fantasy books, not just Sanderson. And so they didn't really stand out to me. Leon was a fun character to read, but she didn't make a lasting impression on me. She's a very forgettable character for me. But like I said before, the story revolves around two characters, Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, hence the title. So. These other characters being not as prominent does not bother me as much, especially because some of the other characters are quite prominent and are quite interesting to read. Design was one of my favorite characters. I think she had some of the best lines in the story. So yeah, uh, character-wise, I think, as usual, Sanderson knocked it out of the park. There is There are no complaints from me whatsoever. So this is the part where we get into the spoiler discussion and yeah, there, there are definitely, a, there is definitely a lot to talk about, so.
spoilers from here on if you haven't read the book go read it hopefully come back i'll hold up a card for you guys okay so i talked about how sanderson sparked an interesting debate within the story with this book of late especially in the last 2 maybe 3 years we've started to see the rise of artificial intelligence being used for art and how a lot of actual artists who make their own art find this very concerning because what uh, the artificial intelligence generated art is doing right now is it takes on like various uh, pieces of art from real artists and uses those that information to draw something by itself so while a lot of people have made the argument that that's pretty much what real artists do as well they look at other other art styles they and they adapt and they make their own art the artists argue that this is essentially plagiarism or copying of art now as someone who writes i stand with the artists obviously i don't think we should be encouraging artificial intelligence generated art i feel like we're doing a disservice to actual artists and we're starting to see the effects of that in uh, the hollywood industry as well where the writers have gone on strike and i see a lot of artists online so you guys know i'm a huge wheel of time fan and we see a lot of uh, people on book twitter as well as the wheel of, wheel of time twitter which is twitter of time talk about how using ai art whether it's for your own fan art sake or whatever basically trains this uh thing to like take more art from actual artists and turn it into its own and you basically driving art is sort of a job so that is a debate that sanderson has put up in this uh story where the scholars create a machine that can do what you me does stack stones and we start to realize that while the machine objectively stacks better stones there is just something off about those stones it do, they don't feel as precarious because it's done calculatedly there is nothing grand about them there is nothing that the spirits find appealing about them and that is what is causing the whole crisis within the planet of actually forgot what's the plan what the planet's called if any if you can remember let me know in the comment section but yeah so that is a very fun debate that sanderson has sparked within here so then we see art for the sake of art basically is what uh the painter believes in or used to and i really find painter to be one of the most relatable characters that sanderson has written in recent times his his take on why he started to paint and why he stopped painting and then how he slowly begins to paint again i did warn you guys there would be spoilers is very interesting i love the fact that he got addicted to the audience and eventually started to paint for the audience rather than for himself and the moment he lost the audience he lost the ability to paint and it took him a long journey and a lot of revelations for him to realize that he actually never needed an audience in the first place and that the paintings were actually for himself and that's why they were good even the need for an audience is something you want for yourself so one could argue that he never really needed he never really stopped painting for himself it's just that he thought he was painting for someone else while painting for himself and that is why he could no longer paint uh there is one line from the story that i really liked i i was talking about machine versus human earlier and that's what brought this up it can summon spirits but it cannot create art beautiful though it might be art is about creation human creation and one of my favorite uh pieces of art from the story comes at the beginning of chapter 41 there is a piece of art by Ali Ashen titled the competition it is 
glorious. Uh, it is one of the best pieces of art. I'm going to put it up on the screen now. So yeah, uh, the piece of art you see in front of you is titled The Competition by Aliyo Chen. It's at the beginning of chapter 41 and as you can see, it is very beautiful. It resonates with you a lot. It makes you feel the, the love Yumi has for the art form she loves, Stacking Stones. And I, I really, really enjoyed the ending, talking about the ending. One of my favorite things about this book, which is usually a complaint for me with other fantasy, is it's a very modern world. They have television, they have electricity, a type of electricity. They have uh, communication devices, they have cameras, and all of this makes this world very our world, but also not our world, which makes these characters very interesting and that's kind of what i love about the story but on the other hand we see yumi's world which is a very typical fantasy world bizarre things happen with nature and the world itself is pretty regressive but the point i'm trying to make here about the ending is there is a scene where yumi and painter are watching a show on tv Kind of, kind of a TV. They're watching a show and she talks about how endings shouldn't be sad because when you can make everything, why make a sad ending? And he says sad endings are more realistic. So they have, they have the small happy endings versus sad endings conversation. And obviously everybody who read the book probably knew that this was foreshadowing something. Now, obviously, it does feel like it's being foreshadowed. It's foreshadowing something. But once the ending comes to you, you start to realize that it foreshadowed both sides of the story. There were sad endings. In my opinion, this book was a happy ending when you look at it from the perspective of did Yumi and Painter reunite? Absolutely. Very happy ending. But if you think about what actually was revealed and what you find out, other than saving the lives of a couple of people, it was a pretty sad ending. It was a pretty uh, gut-wrenching end to the book. And I feel like Sanderson really wanted to like show us that he is capable of not writing a sad ending for a shock factor and still be able to deliver an ending just as effectively. He allowed us to have the ending that we wanted while also making us feel the weight of everything that happened, which I feel a lot of writers don't work well with. For the sake of delivering a powerful ending, they often make it sad. And if they make it happy, the ending usually lacks power and feels incomplete and not that satisfying. Um, yeah, so that I feel was a really fun uh, piece of foreshadowing that Sanderson did. The next one I would like to talk about is Okay, this is something very interesting. Usually when I read a book from the Cosmere, the first thing I keep an eye out for is I have a notebook beside me where I'm writing on the page numbers on which there are high Cosmere implications. Because I am someone who really, really likes to collect and connect those dots. And this book was heavily mentioning the Cosmere. But for the first time, and I didn't do this even with Tress of the Emerald Sea, even when I was reading Tress of the Emerald Sea, my focus was always on those Cosmere mentions and I was writing those down and I was trying to see if I can make sense of anything or if I've missed something. I kept looking for those. I honestly didn't care about any of the Cosmere mentions in the story because I was hooked way more on the actual story of Yumi and Nikaro than I was on the possibility of Cosmere mention. I obviously noticed the Cosmere mentions and I made mental notes of them, but I didn't pay as close an attention to them as I usually do. So. For the Cosmere Replications part, I definitely need to do a reread to get the Cosmere mentions and understand them better. But yeah, uh, that's one point. The next one, we talked about the narration and the humor earlier. And while Tress of the Emerald Sea, I thought did a good job with portraying Hoyt as the narrator. I think uh, Hoyt was an excellent narrator even back then. 
I genuinely think Yumi and the Nightmare Painter had a better narrative in Hoyt than Tress of Tendril C did. Because I felt like I was actually talking to wit from the Stormlight Archive rather than a very smart, witty Cosmere being, which I felt was more present in Tress of the Emerald Sea. So moving on to final thoughts. Um, the first one, enjoyability rating. This book is the first book ever that I have read who gets, which gets a nine on the enjoyability scale for me on the first read. A lot of books have gotten 10 on the enjoyability scale, but never on the first read. I usually make it a rule for myself to not give anything higher than eight on the first read. But Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, I wanted to read it slowly. I wanted to start it on a day and finish the book by like the third or fourth day, but I couldn't put it down. I had to finish it in one sitting. Uh, I delayed my lunch by about two hours to make sure I got through a good chunk of the book. And I, there's very few books that can let you do that and still savor the book and remember all of it. And Yumi and the Nightmare Painter did that effectively, effortlessly, effectively. So while Tress of the Emerald Sea felt like a classic fairy tale that you grew up hearing, Yumi and the Nightmare Painter felt like a wholesome, heart-wrenching modern romance film. It felt like I was watching Freaky Friday, but written really well. And obviously, uh, Sanderson did mention that he took a lot of inspiration from Your Name, the Makoto Shinkai movie. And he, he delivered that effect. So I watched Your Name quite recently. And the moment I started reading the book, I really started to feel the same vibes from the story. Um, while a lot of people online have said that that is also because of the Asian-ish vibe that uh, Sanderson picked up. I don't think that had anything to do with it. I think it was more of the characters and the general theme of the story itself. There was no body swapping as much as some people in the comments will now disagree with me as they're watching this. There was no body swapping. Uh, at least not straightforward body swapping. They did swap bodies, but it was a lot more complex than that. And I enjoyed that about the story. I enjoyed that it wasn't simply, oh, you go to this body, you go to this body and figure it out. No. They both traveled together because they are bonded. There's a lot of connection with them with a capital C. So that is something I enjoyed. I really, really loved watching these two characters interact in each other's worlds and how they slowly start to appreciate each other's lives and appreciate each other's existences and presences and learn that what the other person does is valuable just as much as what they do. Um, so that's why I give it a 9 on 10 on the enjoyability scale. Um, talking about the quality, in many ways I don't think this book stands up to the standards that Sanderson has set for himself with his other work, be the Mistborn or for that matter even Tress of the Emerald Sea, I genuinely think the world and the way it was built is not that great. Uh, I would say, I would argue and say Warbreaker did a better job building the world than this book did. But I don't think Warbreaker is a 10 on 10 on quality. But I think Yumi and the Nightmare Painter is a 10 on 10 on quality because world building is not always about getting every detail right. It's about getting the details right, which matter to the theme of the story. And I think Sanderson did that perfectly. He under underbuilt the world which is why this book worked so well. If this book had a very heavy world and a lot of info dump and been a thick book like uh, others are, this story would not have worked as well as it did. And this story would not have succeeded as well as it did. Which is why quality scale, I have to give it a 10 on 10. And yeah, so that's a 10 on 10 on the quality scale. And on the enjoyability rating, it's a nine on 10, which obviously takes overall to the highest overall I have ever given a book on my first read, 19 on 20. So I really enjoyed this book. I hope you guys did as well. If you guys haven't read the book and stuck around for the spoiler discussion because you thought you won't be reading it, I assure you, you will not regret reading this book. This book is probably the best book I've read this year and I've read some good ones. I read Tress of the Emerald Sea earlier this year. I read uh, Shadow of What Was Lost by James Islington. 
and I read tomorrow, 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 and tomorrow, and tomorrow by Gabriel Zevin, but none of them, with the exception of Tress of the Emerald Sea, come close to how much I enjoyed reading this book. This book is, without a doubt, for me, Sanderson's most exciting and entertaining work. I won't say best, but his most exciting work, nonetheless. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I will be dropping another uh, book review soon on The Sun and the Star by Rick Riordan. I really enjoyed that book as well. If you guys want to be able to read the book by the time I drop the video, start reading it today because that video is be coming out maybe in a week, maybe 10 days, but it's definitely coming out. I will see you guys then. Until then, goodbye. Have a nice one.